Welcome to Decision Vision, a podcast series focusing on critical business decisions. Brought to you by Brady Ware and Company. Brady Ware is a regional, full-service accounting and advisory firm that helps businesses and entrepreneurs make visions a reality. Welcome to Decision Vision, a podcast giving you, the listener, clear vision to make great decisions. In each episode, we discuss the process of decision-making on a different topic from the business owner's or executive's perspective. We aren't necessarily telling you what to do, but we can put you in a position to make an informed decision on your own and understand when you might need help along the way. My name is Mike Blake, and I'm your host for today's program. I'm a director at Brady Ware & Company, a full-service accounting firm based in Dayton, Ohio, with offices in Dayton. Columbus, Ohio, Richmond, Indiana, and Alpharetta, Georgia, which is where we are recording today. Brady Ware is sponsoring this podcast. If you like this podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcast aggregator, and please consider leaving a review of the podcast as well. So today we're going to talk about, I think, a very timely decision. It's certainly all over the all over the place. Um, the decision to allow or perhaps even re- require employees to work from home. So just as a recap and spoiler alert, um, you know, we, we started off 2020, what sounds like 298 years ago, and um, uh, minding our own business when all of a sudden um, we have been cold clocked by a global pandemic known as the novel coronavirus 19. And um, as, as a result, extraordinary things have occurred in the day-to-day lives of most people and have impacted businesses in some fashion. Some businesses have been very positively impacted. If you're in the, 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 um, the, the mask business, I think you're probably doing pretty well. Um, and some have been very negatively impacted. Um, you know, examples of that are going to be in hospitality and, uh, and travel. And, uh, but, but, you know, for, for a lot of companies, you know, maybe, maybe you haven't necessarily been, been all that financially impacted directly, but because of the way that, that, that experts have recommended, uh, and I'm trying to keep this as non-political as possible. I, I don't understand why a virus has become political, but it has. Um, but experts have recommended that, that, um, we basically keep our distance from one another. The, the best thing that we can do to prevent ourselves from getting sick and being a carrier to others is to simply um, keep our distance and to create barriers and to limit our contact with strangers. And the more we can do that, the better. And as a response to that, um, many companies have either uh, created an option to for their employees to work from home where they previously hadn't done, there are companies like ours that have kept the offices open, um, but are um, not necessarily encouraging employees to come back. Um, I, you know, I think in our Dayton office, it's probably a little bit more populated. In our Atlanta office, I think we're, I, I think we're, you know, again, the doors are open, but we're not exactly, um, we're not exactly sending engraved invitations for people to come back in. Um, and then there are companies that have simply sent all their employees home, lock, stock, and barrel. Whether you want to come in or not, too bad. We're, you know, we just we don't feel like we can make it safe. We don't think it's the responsible thing for our employees, for our customers, and and for our community. And and this has created overnight massive challenges in terms of leadership, in terms of of management, um, in terms of personnel development. In terms of the, a lot of the ways that we were, have been taught to lead and manage have, have suddenly been rendered inert and moved to the sideline. And we've talked a little bit about this in some of the other podcasts. We have talked to people about managing remote teams and how do you support somebody working from home and how do you support the, the, the work from home person. But those are very early in COVID. Those are very early in this experience in March and April and the heady days where I think a lot of us thought that by now, as we record this uh, in mid October of 2020, if we hadn't put this behind us, we would at least have seen a, uh, a bright light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and to that, to, to that end, this proves is, is proving elusive. And so, you know, 
we have to think, I think now, and, and, and companies are thinking in longer term, this isn't a short term thing. And, and we're finding also that some companies are doing very well with, with work from home. Some companies are contemplating making this permanent. And one of the upshots on this is, is um, it creates a cloudy outlook for the commercial real estate space. Um, we don't know if we're going to need real estate as much as we did, or if we did, it may be configured differently. Um, it may be a different kind of real estate altogether. For example, I just read an article yesterday. It was on LinkedIn. I want to say it's from the Wall Street Journal, but I'm not entirely certain that skyscrapers are now very much out of vogue because you don't want to stick people in elevators. And if the elevators are going 100 floors, um, that's tough to do two people at a time. You're going to have a lot of people getting sick in the lobby instead of the elevator, right? So it's opening up all kinds of, of, of unanticipated and strange kind of gyrations about, about decision-making in this regard. And so I think, you know, now every business decision maker does have a decision in front of them, whether they're actively pursuing it or whether they're deferring it. At some point, you are going to have to decide whether or not you're going to send your team, your workforce home, whether intentionally or, or comprehensively or whether by some sort of option. Um, most employees seem like to work from home, although some do not. Um, and there's increasing information available that suggests that working from home uh, is, um, on the whole, a boon to, to productivity. So um, that's a long preamble, but a long preamble because this is a complicated and a very important topic. And uh, joining us today is our first repeat guest. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he, he was on earlier this year to talk about hiring veterans, uh, also a very important topic. I, I'm fortunate I have a veteran working on my team now, um, a Marine who is extremely effective. We're, we're happy to have him, very lucky to have him. Um, but, but, you know, he came on really not to talk about his professional capacity, but um, Jason Jones is, you know, he, he's done something very, very interesting. I think very cre- courageous. I think it's going to be a case study someday. I really do. Um, and that is that he is a tenant representative and he'll talk about what exactly that means. But in, in effect, he helps people, helps companies find commercial real estate. And he is, he's taken a step where I, you know, he's decided that he sees the world roughly the way that I've described and he'll, he'll speak for himself in a minute, but he's done something really interesting where, you know, the temptation would be to, to find all kinds of arguments why he should still come back into the office. Cause that's, you know, that, that's how he makes his living. But instead he's taken the extraordinary step of risking cannibalizing his own business and making himself an expert on working from home and remote management and remote remote work services. And frankly, I don't know of anybody who has made themselves the expert on this. Um, there are people who have written about it, but Jason has really made himself a student of it. So we're taking the extraordinary step. We normally like to have about a couple of years between appearances by guests. But um, I decided to break this rule because um, it's depriving you, the listener, of the opportunity to benefit from his specialized expertise where frankly there isn't a lot of it out there so i'm going to reintroduce uh my friend and now uh now holds the world record for appearances for appearances on the decision vision podcast who is jason jones who is now head of technology and remote advisory services at cressa and just as a reminder cressa is an international commercial real estate firm headquartered in uh in the city of washington they represent tenants and provide real estate services, including corporate services, strategic planning, transaction management, project management, facilities management, workfla- workforce and location planning, portfolio lease administration, capital market supply chain management, sustainability and sublease and distribution. Formed in 1993, Cressa has now more than now has more than 60 offices and 90 employees. Jason graduated from Duke University before serving the United States Navy as an A6 intruder aviator. After departing the Navy, Jason earned an MBA, MBA from Arizona State University and completed a 15-month solo trip around the world about which he wrote and published a, a book, uh, Nomad Letters from a Western Lap of the World. Um, 
in response to the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on how businesses are thinking about real estate, Jason founded the Remote Advisory Service Practice. The Remote Advisory Service Practice helps clients leverage advances in technology and a new culture of acceptance for work from anywhere to attract and retain talent, reduce expenses, and reimagine the workplace. Jason, welcome back to the program. Thank you. It's great to be here, Mike, and uh, I am thrilled to hold a new world record. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, and we I, have, um, we'll send it to Guinness. <laughs> that's what I was hoping. <laughs> Wonderful. It's great to be here, and it's always good to see you. I, I just enjoy uh, being with you, and I really have a high regard for what you've done with Decision Vision. Well, uh, thank you. Do, I do appreciate that. It's nice to, nice, nice to hear there's at least one listener out there. So um, just we didn't really get into this in the last program because that wasn't the topic. So we're going to get into it now. And the first question is, describe your, describe your day job, and, and maybe from a perspective pre-coronavirus in particular, what, what was your day job then? And kind of what did your typical client, what did your service profile typically look like? Sure. And I, and I will tell you that I personally, I'm a bit of an odd duck in the commercial real estate industry. Um, but what I'll do, I think is most relevant is describe the business model of my company Got and it. then how I fit in. Good. But the business model of Cressa, as you so well described, is uh, we are advocates for the occupier of space. CRESA is an acronym, Corporate Real Estate Service Advisors. So we serve and advise our clients who are the occupiers of corporate real estate. And that's 99% for us means office space and warehouse space. And um, our job is to act as an advisor, helping companies develop and nonprofit organizations develop their strategy for where they should have an office or a warehouse. Um, how much space should they have? How should it be designed? And then once we figure those things out, we go to the market, we help find the best fit, maybe three to five options, allow them to compete for our client's business in an ethical manner that drives prices down, that drives concessions up. And, um, and then ultimately we help them implement moving into that space by managing the relocation project or the construction project. And then once that's done, or perhaps even at the very beginning of the process, if they're already in space, we help them go through that process and renew their office or warehouse at better terms than they would be able to otherwise. So it's a, a real estate strategy and implementation business. So it's funny, all the years I've known you, and as long as I've known you, you've been with Cress. I think I've known you almost since you started, but I don't yes. think I ever knew what it stood for. <laughs> so, um, and I should, I, should, I should have known it was an acronym, but I, you know, I never asked. So I'm, that's a bucket list item that's been ticked off. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we're going to get sort of a second piece of value out of you here because this story intersects with something that I think a lot of people are facing in 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 the coronavirus environment, which is your business was, has clearly been, or at least it seems to me has been disrupted. So, you know, March, April rolls around, the world changes rapidly and it's unclear where it's going to change to people start being sent home on mass. What, what starts going through your mind as a real estate advisor and as somebody who frankly makes a living on, on, you know, in helping people find the right space and, and getting square footage settled. Yeah. It, well, immediately, the very first thing that went through my mind was business continuity, which is how are my clients, our firm's clients, and, and just other companies and nonprofits going to, um, to be able to maintain business continuity? Um, how well set up or how well prepared are they for sending everyone home? And it was practically overnight. And it was, as you recall, mandates, government mandates, which really took a lot of, kind of mercifully took the decision away from leaders as to whether or not to send people home, and they had to. So that very first thought in my mind was, how are companies and nonprofit organizations going to be able to continue to operate with everyone working in a totally different environment than they normally did? Do they have the technology that's available? Because this is going to now require technology that perhaps they have and perhaps they don't. So that was thought number one. Um, but thought number two 
very soon thereafter, Mike, and I just a light bulb went off in my mind right away was, wow, I think that this is going to be a long lasting. Um, I certainly didn't think it was going to be a year or more, but I cert- I did think it was going to be several months. And I thought to myself, companies are going to need help understanding how to get this um, this balance right between working from home and then one day returning to the office when that happens. And I thought maybe it would be six months. That was my personal thought at the time. Okay. Um, but But the idea of companies now experiencing a remote workforce, and by remote, in this case, remote at home, although remote can mean also another office location or a coffee shop. It could mean any number of locations, Um, but remote at home in this case, how are they going to balance that with their central office, which they still have, they're still paying for, and now has in a large way become a non-performing asset? Um, So how can we help them balance those two things and get the right blend when the day comes that they will um, have the no restrictions, no healthcare restrictions on returning to the office. So, um, so you, 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 so you started thinking in advance about the needs. At one point, did you start to, to come to a a realization that this is not just a, a service imperative for your clients, but also probably the right business move for you personally and for the firm? Um, and and again, that was very, very early on because I recognize, and you have to understand, if you go to the landing page for Cressa's website, in big, bold letters, it says, think beyond space. Hmm. So that's our mantra. And the reason that we can do that is because we only represent or advocate for the occupier of space, never landlords. So we're not solely focused on how do we fill buildings, which a landlord, that would be their interest. The owner of property wants to fill that building. That's their business model. Our business model is advisory services for the occupant, which includes leasing space or owning space, warehouse space, office space, but it also includes helping companies with their bigger picture business strategy that leads downstream to the support infrastructure of corporate real estate. Real estate is simply support for the larger business model. So we help companies understand um, uh, how are they going to manage multiple leases? How should that space be designed to maximize uh, the benefits of culture and help to, to enhance their culture? Um, how can they use space to maximize the retention and recruitment of talent, bringing in the best and the brightest? How can they use space to, um, uh, or, or how can they use technology to enhance the workforce experience so that they can have higher productivity and greater engagement with their uh, employees? So there's a bigger picture that uh, our company takes, and it's not just focused on space, it's focused on the holistic approach to a company's business. And then we solve a lot of these business problems by leveraging real estate and beyond, which gets into how I'm a bit of an odd duck in the corporate real estate industry, which is through technology, where I have a specialization, and now through workforce strategy, which includes remote work as one component of a larger workforce strategy. So if I'm understanding this correctly, I want to make sure this is really clear because it is an instructive piece of the conversation. It it sounds like to some extent you always, you've always seen yourself and it sounds like you believe your firm sees itself as a consultant on optimizing real estate as an asset or as a, well, as an operating asset and not just, not just trying to put bodies in square footage. Absolutely. And, and that made this, this, I don't want to say transition, maybe this evolution, if I can use that term. Yes. It sounds like it made that evolution more natural than it might seem on the outside. Absolutely. Because, Mike, when you think about it, and every company listening, everyone making a decision out there about their, their workforce, um, my question that I pose is, how can you possibly 
design your office space and commit to a certain footprint, a certain amount of office space, if you don't first know where your employees are going to be working and how they're going to be communicating, collaborating, and ultimately using that space. You've got to do the work up front on the workforce strategy, which includes remote work. It includes a central office. There's tremendous benefits to both, and there are challenges to both. So, But you've got to figure that out before then you go downstream and say, okay, now that we understand and have confidence in our workforce strategy, where people are going to be working, how they're going to be communicating and collaborating, we've got the right technology in place, we have the right policies, we have compliance in place, then we can design the space to fit that need and commit to a certain expense, a certain amount of space. And by the way, that commitment in real estate and understanding the nature of real estate is very important. It's inflexible. You're going to commit for a minimum of three years, but typically five to 10 years up to a certain amount of space. And while there's some flexibility with sublease rights and expansion rights and rights of first refusal, it's cumbersome to make changes. So you want to get it right up front and you want to have confidence that your plan for real estate fits your the precursor conversation of what is your workforce strategy? Where are, going, are people going to be working? And what is most advantageous for higher productivity, better recruiting and retention of talent, and better financial returns? So you're typically talking to your clients at, at, at the C-level, whether it's a CFO, COO, or CEO. CEO. Um, what concerns are they most expressing to you about work from home slash work from anywhere? I think one of the biggest things that we hear is I want to protect uh, the culture of my organization. And there is a concern that extended work from home will have a deleterious effect on their culture because culture is best established with in-person relationships, right? Where you're face-to-face, you can see each other, and uh, there's just something that's intangible about how that relationship is developed in person versus remotely. But my counsel to them, and I think the real concern is 100% work from home, which is basically what we're still experiencing right now. I would say on average, and this is anecdotal, and we see a few statistics here and there, that it's approximately 10 to 20% of people are occupying their office space generally across uh, the U.S. and Canada. Um, some that's are true for us in Alpharetta. Yeah, so that's that's a that's about right. I think that's a fair number right now. Um, so that's a very large percentage that are not coming into the central shared office. And the concern is that that's going to have an effect on their culture long term. How can they be creative? You're missing serendipitous moments. Tim Cook was of Apple was just interviewed by the Atlantic uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he said that's one of his great concerns and that they have designed their um, their office space at their headquarters to have common areas where people hang out and interact and mingle so that you can have serendipitous moments. You can have creative moments, share creative thoughts, and you can't schedule those things. But I, I think what's going to happen is as we cross the hurdle eventually of a post-COVID environment, Now you're going to have an opportunity for what I call purposeful collaboration. And that is a leader or a manager making a purposeful decision about when and where that person's team collaborates, either works together or works independently. And that collaboration can occur in person or that collaboration can occur virtually with someone at home and someone at the office or two people at home or whatever the case may be. And I think that when you can blend those two things and find the right balance, this is back to culture, you're going to be able to really make sure you're getting all the benefits of the central office, as well as leveraging this newfound cultural acceptance for working from home. So um, I think implicit in that is the glue that holds that, that culture thesis together is 
communication, right? Without, without communication, there's no community. There's no, there's no culture. What are you seeing emerging in terms of best practices that, that allow um, easy communication among uh, workers and uh, across um, different platforms of the organization uh, or different segments of the organization versus being overly intrusive and, you know, getting into, you know, nearly spying on your employees, basically. Yes. What are some best practices you're seeing there? Well, again, this comes back to leadership, leadership and thoughtful planning. Um, there are many tools, software tools, telecommunication tools to allow for communication between remote employees. We're using one right now. This is a communication tool. Um, and there are collaboration tools as well, software, but it's how you choose to use them that's most important. And I think one of the, my, uh, pieces of advice for organizations out there is to come up with cultural norms for how you as a team or as an organization communicate with each other. And examples of this would be, um, What are our hours when we are expected to respond to either voicemails and email and text messages so that we keep some structure and boundaries on our personal life and our home life? So it could be, hey, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., it's fair game, or 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., whatever the case may be. Um, But after that, we have no expectation that you will reply to communication. Um, It could mean we are we as an organization or as a team are going to agree that we're going to have our cameras on when we have a zoom call or a ring central call um but on certain uh calls perhaps just fun ones at the end of the week you don't have to have your camera on so we're going to decide culturally how we're going to communicate visually where we can see each other or where it's okay to be walking your dog around the neighborhood while you're on your conference call you can do that now why shouldn't you Let's have a cultural understanding of what's acceptable and what's not. Um, So there's a number of things that I think people can agree to. But the other key piece for communication um, is is making sure that um, you're giving appropriate and consistent feedback to the remote employee. That's very important because otherwise, someone who is working remotely can feel they're on an island. They can feel isolated. And they're just not sure, am I meeting standards? Am I doing my job the way people want? Give me some feedback. So consistent, um, frequent, informal feedback. And everyone has to define what frequent means for them and their team. But I think that's a key part of communication is making sure, and it goes both ways. The manager needs feedback also on how they're doing and it's sort of in a 360 view. But that's what I would advise is to really focus on um, good feedback, consistent, informal communication, and then planned formal communication that perhaps is a little bit more often business reviews, for instance, than they may have been when everyone was in the office together. You know, your, 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 your comments here strike me as something that I've observed Personally, I'm curious how you'd react to this. Um, a lot of what you're talking about, I would argue, are best practices, even as of January 1st, 2020. You know, providing consistent feedback, providing uh, uh, protocols for communication, setting realistic boundaries. It's it's interesting to me how how coronavirus and the pandemic are in a lot of ways, it's what's old, what's old is what's new, right? Is it, is it, it's, it's, it's forcing us to revisit the, the fundamentals, I think of leadership and management and, and be much more, much more intentional, I guess, because being in person may, maybe sometimes gives us a margin for error that we wouldn't ordinarily have. I'm not sure what it is, but I hope you get my meaning is, is that yes. a lot of these things you're suggesting, I, I, excuse, I'm not denigrating them at all. Um, but, but merely, merely pointing out that these have been best practices before, but I think one of the lessons is that if they were important before, they're 10 times as important now. Yes. They're accentuated. 
for sure. Because in the if you're in the office together, there's a feeling you can manage by walking around. Just kind of you feel it. Whereas yep. here you have to be purposeful about the communication and the feedback. And frankly, it, it can sharpen a leader. It can sharpen a manager uh, to be more effective than they may have been otherwise. Uh, I think that's a great point. I, and, and it, it gets into my next question beautifully, which is, you know, how have managers had to adapt to work from home or work from anywhere. And I think you just nailed it. Now I'll, I'll ask you to add to it if you would like to, but that, that ability to manage by walking around is, is, is not there. Um, and you know, it, it reminds me of, as, as, as you know, I'm a, I'm a big baseball fan. There used to be a player for the Yankees, Bernie Williams. He played center field for them. And, you know, he was, he was not the greatest center fielder in terms of anticipating where the ball was going to hit, but it was such a great, a great athlete. He could basically outrun his mistakes. And with, with, with work from home, work from anywhere, you can't, you can't sort of outwork your mistakes by managing by by walking around because you just that tool is not available you must be more intentional because you're one of the tools for kind of making up for that just simply has been removed yes it's interesting i've read and you know, i've done a lot of reading as you mentioned i really have become a student of this over the past several months um and there was a very interesting article about different qualities are now being rewarded and are more advantageous in a leader than they than there were when everyone was in the office together. So previously, a charismatic, gregarious leader um, could uh, had a lot of sway, had a lot of pull, and those, but but maybe perhaps they weren't the most um, uh, effective at actually getting things done and staying on course and staying on schedule. Now, getting things done, staying on course, staying on schedule is so important. And those interpersonal, gregarious, charismatic qualities are uh, not as effective virtually as they are in person. So it's it's requiring different aspects of a leader to be successful. And what's going to be really interesting is when you get into a place where we can find the right balance between the two locations, remote and in office, and allowing both of those personalities to be successful. That's a really interesting point. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go off script here because because I think that's such a smart point. Uh, at least I think so because I I hadn't thought of it, but I think you're dead right. And that is that that coronavirus really does play into the hands of of the technical manager, not the technician per se, but the technical manager that that understands, embraces, likes, is good at the nuts and bolts of managing, which is coordinating coordinating resources to preside, to produce a desired result within the desired constraints, whether those are time, budget, whatever they are. And, and the charismatic leader, and there's, there's value to that, um, the charismatic leader for sure. But the charismatic leader, I, I think I agree with you because of how communication is, has to work a lot harder for those charismatic qualities to be effective. Yes. And, yes, and maybe they do. even in the short term, they're not even as valuable if, you know, they'll eventually come back. But there is a point in a crisis where it's not about charisma, it's about execution. That is correct. <laughs> and so what's interesting and what can be helpful for organizations who are out there listening is there are uh, personnel assessments. So we in our consulting, uh, we we use um, we have partnerships with multiple organizations and there's a there's a few that that leverage personnel assessments that um, they're basically psychological tests, kind of like a Myers-Briggs. I mean, think about that, yep. although it's, it's different because it's geared towards the remote work environment. And th- these are important because they help organizations understand, they help people understand themselves, and they also help managers understand those who are reporting to them, those who they are leading, so they can best manage them based on their aptitude for remote work, how well they tend to focus. Do they like, are they an introvert? Do they like to work uh, alone? Do they really need uh, or, or thrive on interpersonal communication? So you change your management 
uh, a little bit depending on the employee and their their personnel assessment. So, so you know, we've talked about how managers are having to change. What changes are you seeing in how employees operate, carry themselves, seek to add value to the organizations with uh, for you know with which they work? Well, I think it, it, that really goes back to um, just making sure that they are having expectations set. So asking for feedback from their managers, understanding what the expectations are so that they can meet or, or exceed them and, um, and just and making sure that they are getting those things done. Um, I think that's really important. And, you know, it's also really important. I want to go back to the manager just for a second. It's important for leadership at the top of the organization to do a good job of communicating larger mission and larger goals. And this goes back to my time in the military. This is very much of a military concept Hmm. so that the remote worker who is operating unsupervised throughout the day can make independent decisions that are in are, that are congruous with that are in alignment with the larger goals of the organization. So there's a leadership challenge here. There's a leadership requirement to do a good job of communicating big picture goals and mission. So again, that the unsupervised independent worker can make those uh, decisions real time on their own that supports the larger mission. And that's the same thing as a, you know, you want your fire team out in the field understanding the big picture strategy that the that the battalion commander has back at headquarters, so they can make decisions at the you know the tip tip the tip of the spear. Right. So let, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, the the office is changing, but you know it's not going away. We're still going to need and want, I think, office space. I'm going to ask you to put your futurist hat on a little bit. Um, you know, think a year or two from now, how, how do office, how do we think about office space differently? How, how do office spaces look and function differently a couple of years from now? Sure. Well, a lot of this will depend on the organization and how they use the space because a law firm is very different than a software development firm. So, so par- partly it, it really is, cu- it needs to be customized to the organization. But I think what you're going to find is as uh, work from home or remote work um, becomes more deeply ingrained in the everyday fabric of the uh, corporate America nonprofit organizations, et cetera, you're going to find the design of space to be different than before and the technology to be different than before. And so, and specifically, I think you're going to find um, a lot more flexibility in the way the workspace is designed. You're going to want to be able to move things around as organizations grow. And they have some people that now maybe they they need to be in the office more often during a certain project, and then they want to be remote um, during another project. So you're want, going to want some flexibility in how the furniture can be arranged. So actually, I think furniture is going to be a very important part of this, um, creating environments, not just through hard walls, but through the way furniture is arranged and creating different environments for um, more casual I'm going to say coffee shop type environments because people are working in coffee shops, real coffee shops right now. And they want to have that feeling and environment at the office as well. That's what will woo them to come into the office. So I think space will need to be designed to woo um, employees to want to come there as opposed to preferring to be at home where they have their setup and um, they're very comfortable and they feel very productive there. So that, that, that is interesting to me because I did not anticipate you would say that only because before this whole thing started, I've read so much about how um, open workspaces have generally been considered to be a management experiment that has failed. Um, they've been enormously disruptive. They've prevented, while they've perhaps facilitated collaboration on the margin, 
they've completely destroyed the, the, the potential for so-called deep work and deep thought. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you're, I mean, you're right. Even now, I imagine people are still working at Starbucks and people love to go out to a, I think people miss being able to go out to a place where they can just hang out for a couple of hours in an open space by themselves with a pair of, um, of noise canceling headphones. Yeah. And that, that just occurred to me kind of what, what kind of a paradox that is. And that really sounds like you're dancing on the head of a pin there of, of how do you create a space that is both open and welcoming, but also not chaotic. Yes. And it, it, this is all about culture and leadership, which I go back to every time is it's kind of like when I go to Starbucks or an independent coffee shop that I particularly like, that's not a Starbucks. Um, I, People don't come up and interrupt me and ask me questions, mm. right? Yeah. And when I go to the library, there's a culture that it's, shh, we're in a library. It's quiet. And I think you can create those areas in office space. And then there's going to be other areas that the culture is, hey, you're in the, you're in the romper room over here. You know, you're going to get interrupted or this is where we're playing games. And then there's going to be other places that are going to be that are dedicated to heads down work. And I think there's going to be a lot of and I'll uh, you know, it's um, I'll, I'll go ahead and use the uh, the corporate name, a Zoom room, yeah. which could be any type of technology. But basically, they will be smaller rooms where people can gather together teams to have a, uh, a video conference call and a collaboration working session with another office. And people were doing that before COVID. It's just going to become more prevalent now that there's a greater, broader cultural acceptance for using this type of technology and working remotely. A, a, uh, a, man a management challenge has started to come to light, which is work from home, work from anywhere, dress codes, right? Where, where, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of jokes. I certainly use the tortured stereotype enough, you know, you, you see me in a three piece suit above, above the line, below the line, you just don't know what there's, there is there. And, and frankly, you don't want to even imagine it or go there. Right. And, and, you know, as, as, as people have slipped into a work from home, their, their, their personal morning routines have have changed because they don't feel like there's a certain level of preparation. I think some companies are worried that's gone kind of too far. Um, are, are you aware of that trend and that concern as well? And, and what do you see evolving in that regard in terms of work from home slash work from anywhere dress codes? Well, I think this goes back to two things. Again, it's culture and leadership. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the culture of our organization? What do we wear when we go into the office? That's different for every company, but we have a culture that we all agree this is what we wear. Um, and that same culture should apply or should be set for video conference calls. And that's just leadership deciding either you can mandate or you can come to a collective consensus. And that's a leadership decision as to which path you want to take. But that's what that comes down to. Is, and that's why I think people need to be thoughtful and purposeful. This is why we guide companies through a roadmap where there is a step-by-step -step process through which they cover all of these decisions. Everything that we're talking about are so important to creating a thoughtful, balanced, and sustainable workforce strategy that includes remote work. So I think people should go through that roadmap and ask these different questions of themselves and, just, and, and be a leader and take initiative to set those standards. We are speaking with Jason Jones from Cressa on the Decision Vision podcast and, and talking about um, uh, work from home, work from anywhere arrangements for a workforce. Um, Jason, we're running up against our, our, uh, our time here, but I do have a couple of questions I want to get in here. And, and one is, you know, as you have self-described or you described yourself as a student of this work from home, work from anywhere phenomenon, is there a company out there you think is really getting it right? Is there somebody that you, you say, you know what, as a good kind of role model, this is a company that, that is kind of setting the standard for best practices? Well, what's challenging about that question is 
it's hard to know who is getting it right um, from a balanced perspective because most companies aren't able to have the balance yet because there's still a healthcare restriction yeah. for, and by the way, that is where the rubber is going to hit the road from a leadership perspective is once that is removed, leaders are going to be challenged with what's the right balance? What's the right decision? How do I, how can I be purposeful in my collaboration? And I think that forward thinking organizations are looking at that now. They're looking over the horizon and there's other leaders that are going to get caught flat footed. So, um, I, the, but but one company that I will tell you that is of interest, and you can Google them and read, they've got a lot of information about work from home. It's a 100% remote company. So that's a little bit different, a little bit of an outlier, but they've got some good information about working remotely, and they've done it very well, very successfully. It's a company called Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R. They're 100% remote. They've been around since 2011, so they're successful. They have over 300 employees in 28 countries. So now they have a business model. It's software development that lends itself to that. But if you want to read some interesting information about how they do it, I think you can pick some nuggets out of there for your organization that very, very likely will need a balanced strategy to be sustainable. Jason, it's been a great conversation. We could we could make this uh, an all day seminar, um, but of, of course we don't have, we don't have the ability to do that. If somebody has questions about this work from home, work from anywhere phenomenon, either as an employer or employee, can they contact you with a question? And if so, how best can they do that? Absolutely. And I want to say two things. You can always Google my name, Jason Jones, Atlanta, and I'll pop right up. So that's probably the easiest to remember. My email address is Jones at cressa.com. And I do a webinar every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 2 p.m. Eastern. We've been doing it for three and a half months now where we talk about the challenges and the benefits of remote work and the roadmap to navigate your way to a successful strategy. So if that is of interest, it's free. There's no charge. We have people come on all the time. And, and again, we do it, uh, it's very easy to schedule to every second and fourth Tuesday of the month. Well, thank you. I have a feeling you'll get some takers on that. Um, that's going to wrap it up for today's program. I'd like to thank Jason Jones so much for joining us and sharing his expertise with us. We'll be exploring a new topic each week. So please tune in so that when you're faced with your next executive decision, you have clear vision when making it. If you enjoy these podcasts, please consider leaving a review with your favorite podcast aggregator. It helps people find us so that we can help them. Once again, this is Mike Blake. Our sponsor is Brady Ware & Company, and this has been the Decision Vision Podcast.